or the Tennessee chapter. You are uh, joining us tonight in our virtual education series. We're gonna have one meeting um, on the second Tuesday of every month at 6.30 Central Time, 7.30 Eastern Time. So once you've registered for one meeting, you can use the same Zoom link to access all of them. That's how I have it set up because people um, tend to lose Zoom links and get confused around that. Um, we wanna thank our sponsors, which would be uh, Genentech and Unicure for helping with this event tonight. And I will introduce Dr. Fader and we can get started. As again, reminder that um, I am recording the meeting. So if, if you do speak, you are welcome to, you can ask your question on mute and ask, or you can send it to me in the chat. But we are very thankful that Dr. Fader is here and joining us tonight. He is an assistant professor of psychiatry and neurology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and medical director of neuropsychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He received his PhD from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And, and is MD from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, then completed training in psychiatry and consultation liaison psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He works as the attending psychiatrist at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, HDSA Center of Excellence, where he cares for patients with HD and trains new psychiatrists to do the same. Dr. Fader, thank you for joining us once again, and um, the time is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Margot, and, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's it's really a pleasure to be to be speaking to you all. Um, and so I will just get started. I have no no uh, not, nobody's paying me, uh, unfortunately. If anybody wants to work out a deal, I'm available, uh, but no disclosures today. Um, and so we're going to be talking about uh, caregiver stress and um, you know related to Huntington's disease. And as you're all familiar. Um, Huntington's is a very complicated um, neurological illness that uh, affects people's movements, affects people's behavior, affects their cognition. So, um, you know, as the disease progresses, all of those things to varying degrees are going to be affected and they're going to interact with one another. Um, so worsening movements can mean, you know, increased anxiety, uh, more depression can have impact on ability to think, um, you know, when people are anxious, also movements increase, all of these things are, are interrelated. And so we kind of treat the disease as a whole. Um, and we know also that, that Huntington's affects the whole family. So, you know, we may have all the people who um, are not displaying symptoms of Huntington's are green here, the blue people are displaying symptoms. So we have a person with Huntington sort of in the middle of this cluster of this familial cluster. And we know that they had one affected parent and one unaffected parent. Um, they may have an affected sibling or an at-risk sibling or any combination of those. Oh, and I advance my slides. Um, and then they'll have children who will be at risk um, and presumably an, an unaffected partner in here somewhere. And so all of these people around the affected person, particularly the people in green, may possibly be caregivers um, and are gonna be affected in varying ways by, by Huntington's disease and have varying amounts of stress um, due to the Huntington's. And so we know that, that a person with HD may have grown up in a household um, with HD um, and the, the children of somebody with HD likewise are growing up in a household with HD and that, that's gonna affect how they see the illness and how they see themselves and how they, they manage the stress around, around the illness. Um, and so who's gonna be a caregiver? Well, for, um, for Huntington's disease, it's, it's usually gonna be a family member or a combination of family members. Um, for some of the other neurodegenerative illnesses, um, there are more paid caregivers involved, but in, in Huntington's, it, it tends to be mostly family. Um, and the most likely person to be taking care of somebody is a spouse or a partner, um, possibly an unaffected parent, um, often a, a parent who has taken care of a spouse with HD and then may take care of their, ch their child um, who also has HD. Um, siblings may be involved and, and also, and as I'll get into a little bit more later, it could be um, adult or even teenage children who are involved in caregiving tasks. And there are some unique features of Huntington's that are gonna increase the amount of stress that caregivers experience. Um, one, as, as I've always already talked about, um, is it's familial. Um, and so many of the natural caregivers, and we think of natural caregivers as, as usually being family, uh, may also be affected by the illness. And so that's gonna, gonna affect the way that, that people can care for each other. Um, there can be a lot of stigma around Huntington's disease. Um, 
that it's a, an inherited disease that it's you know in in genetic makeup um, contributes to that stigma. The fact that it is complex and ha affects all of those things, movement, behavior, and cognition, um, means that you know when when somebody is affected, other people who are not familiar with Huntington's may really not know what to do with that person, may not know how know, may not know how to treat them, and it leads to a lot of stigma around the illness. Um, which which leads to fear of disclosure, which which causes stress. So people don't want other people to know that they have Huntington's, and it also um, leads to people who are at risk being afraid to test. Um, so the uh, the uh, uh, was Genetic Information Non Discrimination Act, I think, is what that is. It uh, is a federal law that protects against discrimination um, in employment and in health insurance for people with uh, genetic conditions. Um, however other protections are gonna vary by the state that you're in. So GINA does not um, lead to protections against discrimination in housing, for example, or in other kinds of insurance, like life insurance, those sorts of things. And depending on what state you live in, those things actually may be protected. Um, we know that, that Huntington's is rare. Um, it can be difficult to find people to care for Huntington's patients. And there's there hasn't been a lot of research into um, treatments. Now, we're, we're doing the research. I mean, I'm not doing the research, but my colleagues who, who are the researchers are doing the research and coming up with, with new ideas about how to find a cure for HD all the time. But when you compare HD to something like, you know, say cancer, uh, diabetes, things that are much more common, there's really relatively little in terms of resources that are going in to, to find cures and to find treatments for symptoms. Um, and the last thing that, that makes Huntington's uh, is unique in the way that it, it uh, causes stress in people is that the usual onset is going to be in young adulthood to middle age. So at a time when people are uh, forming families, raising children, when they would have expected to be at their most productive at work. And that, you know, Huntington's changes all of that. Um, you know, most neurodegenerative uh, illnesses were going to come on later in life, um, which doesn't make them particularly less awful, but it, at striking at a different time means that caregivers um, often are retired. Uh, they may not have young children at home that they need to, to care for. And those things may not complicate um, caregiving duties as they do with HD. Um, and so, you know, why is caregiver stress important? I actually probably don't need to convince anybody that caregiver stress is important. Um, but I, you know, the, anything that has an impact on the quality of somebody's life, in, in my opinion, is, is important. Um, and we're gonna see things like worse physical health outcomes, worse mental health outcomes for caregivers because of the stress that they're under. Um, a lot of times people are solo caregivers. And so if they're overwhelmed by stress, they may not have any backup. And so we need to, to keep that in mind. Um, when, when caregivers are stressed, it really, impacts the quality of life of the person with HD, um, which can lead to increase in behavioral symptoms, which can then make the caregiver stress even worse. Um, and so we, we want to be able to address caregiver stress, not just because we care about the caregivers and we want them to feel better, but also it leads to, to better outcomes sort of across the board. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about stress in terms of a biological phenomenon. Um, and so stress, you know, we think of it as, as a bad thing. Uh, pretty much something that we want to avoid. But the stress response evolved for a reason. Um, so if you think of us in prehistoric times and living in caves and you know needing to hunt for our food and run away from bears and that sort of thing, um, I'm not an anthropologist, so don't quote me on that. But uh, you know you you may have uh, you know you may need to run away from that bear. and you what you want is your body to be able to, get a burst of energy to be able to do that and then to be able to calm down afterwards. And so the stress response is actually what does that. So if you think about the, the bear, that your brain is going to detect that, it's then going to send some signals down through other parts of the brain down into your adrenal glands, which are sitting on top of your kidneys. And they're going to make a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is the thing that gives your body the energy to, to run away. Right. It also causes a lot of other things. It can cause over the long haul irritability, um, decreased uh, mood, those sorts of things. But in the in the immediate term, what it does is it mobilizes energy so that you can run away from the bear. The problem is so, and and then when you're done running away, this this uh, sort of 
your, your body realizes it doesn't need to do that anymore. And the cortisol sort of dissipates and it's not there anymore. And it, it looks sort of like this graph over here, right? You sort of go up and you go down. Um, the problem is when you're not running away from a bear, but what's happening is that you've got stresses that to your body seem pretty similar, but really are there all the time. Um, or they may be there most of the time. And you've got constant stress, which means constant pumping of cortisol into your system. You know, and you get to a point, um, you know, so at some point where you've got cortisol without the relaxation phase. So your body never sort of gets back to normal in order to re regroup. Um, and then a time when it, you can't actually mount the cortisol response at, at all anymore. And either one of those things is gonna have implications for health. Um, the important thing to, to realize here is not so much any of the details of this, but that under um, constant stress or repeated stresses, the system sort of breaks down and it doesn't work like it's supposed to, which can lead to both di um, difficulties with physical health and difficulties with mental health. Okay. And so then we might think, so what are these, what are the stressors that are causing caregiver stress? Um, this is a little bit of a complicated diagram, but down here, basically there are different kinds of stressors. So we can have um, the care recipient, um, their behavior may cause stress, oops. Um, they, the care recipient will need things that, you know, and that may, may be difficulty. Carers kind of have sub subjective stress. So the way that they're interpreting the things that they have to do may be more stressful or less stressful. Um, a lot of times these secondary role strains. So these are things like, needing to work and provide care, needing to care for children and provide care for an affected person, um, not having the income of the affected person any longer leading to financial problems. Those sorts of things are gonna be really big, um, particularly in, in HD families. And all of this can, can lead to caregivers actually feeling pretty bad about themselves and feeling like they're not doing enough all of the time. All of this is the stress that then comes into, you know, uh, difficulty with mental health and physical health that's driving that that cortisol response that I was talking about. And so, you know, I think it's it's important to uh, recognize the experience of people who provide care. Um, and there there have been a couple of studies. There's there's one that I'm taking these quotes from where they did um, interviews with people who are uh, caregivers for people with HD, um, and in this case, family members, and. They, they interviewed them, they talked about the challenges, they talked about it, what, it was, what it was like to provide care, what the good things were, the bad things. Um, and they, they came up with several different themes in terms of what was causing stress. And so the first one is this disintegration of the caregiver's life. So things really, um, you know, so really just sort of falling apart for them in terms of, of, of what's going on in their life. And I, I'm gonna, gonna just read these. Um, and so one person says, have you noticed that in these caregiver groups, they say, you got to do things for you. They give the caregiver of the year award. They give it to people that have literally devoted their own lives and usually wrecked their own health. So indicating that there's really this awareness that that caregiving role um, causes stress that impacts on the health of the caregiver. Um, and, and another one, I, I've had three very close family members die of cancer and you go through it and you don't necessarily get over it but you do get on with your life and there's support for the survivor. You know, with Huntington, the time period is so long and it's just this very slow walk down a very long road. You know, each day is just slightly worse than the day before and there's no end to the tunnel and you don't know what you're gonna face. And so this person is experiencing, you know, some, some hopelessness, some maybe despair is a strong word, but uh, you know, some, some difficulties facing what, what they need to face with the illness. Um, and also sort of indicating that, that in society, uh, they use sort of cancer as the example, there are, there are other illnesses that people get and that um, people are survivors of, uh, or survivors of people who have had them, um, where there's, there's much more awareness within society than there is for something like HD. It's, people are, will often um, express feelings of being really misunderstood as well in terms of what they're going through. Um, they'll experience um, grief about the life that they thought they were going to have or the life that they did have before onset of the illness. Um, one person says, I definitely feel like I'm in some ways, like my life is on hold. Life has been on hold and it needs to be taken off hold. So somebody who has 
literally put their life on hold in order to care for their, their affected family member. Um, and another one, in terms of our social life, he has made a decision not to see anybody. And unfortunately for me, the burden is left with me to keep him company. So another sort of loss of, of social contacts, loss of life as, as this person had envisioned it. Um, people talk about the ever-present shadow, which is basically concern for their children. Um, uh, this this uh, mother says, I used to sit and watch my kids. One of my kids spilled something. I thought, oh my God, no, you know. Sort of referring to that fear that when uh, one of their children does something clumsy, they they trip, they you know make movements that they didn't expect. They they worry about about the illness and their children maybe having inherited it. Um, but what also comes out of these studies is that the adaptations that people make in order to um, to to go on in order to thrive even with the caregiving uh, role. And so some of the things that people do are appreciate positives. So person says, you look for the little things. I got a great family. I got great friends, but our faith in my church has gotten me through more. So, you know, she's, you know, thinking of all of the things in her life that are helping her get through this. Um, anticipatory mourning is something that people do. So that's kind of looking ahead and preparing for, for what's ahead. It may be um, loss of certain kinds of function, loss of, you know, ability to do certain things. Um, it may be anticipating possible um, hospitalizations or uh, needing um, skilled nursing care or anything like that. Um, and, and sort of preparing for those um, actually helps people uh, cope both with the present and with those things if they come to pass. Um, people found that find that setting boundaries around what they can do, what they're willing to do is very helpful. Um, one person says, I come home from work and I want to relax but I take the time to do something with him. And then right after supper, usually I take my time to do my thing. I've learned that I need that time just to get my focus back. And so you know, she's putting aside a, a, a small piece of her day in order to focus on sort of get regrouping, getting her energy together and, and doing something for herself so that she can, she can continue on. Um, people will, will use medication if they end up with a diagnosable depression or, or anxiety type disorder. Um, people also tend to view relationships differently. They'll describe um, going from, say, a, a romantic relationship into a caregiver relationship and, and making that transition into how they, they view the, re the relationship with their affected partner. Um, also modify expectations. Um, we still do a lot. We go on trips, we go to the theater, I kind of pave the way before we do a lot of things. As long as I plan everything, she will do them, but it's hard to live with that part of it. So this is this is a, a husband who's taking care of his wife who knows that if he's if if they're going to be able to do things, he needs to prepare and needs to make sure that everything is sort of right and then can take his wife out and and do those things and so can still enjoy doing things uh, maybe that they used to do or or that they can still enjoy doing, but there's a lot more work involved in in preparing for that. Um, hope for a cure keeps many people going. Um, this, this person says, my daughter has two babies. They're just on the firm convi conviction that there's going to be something out there by the time those boys get to anywhere that something's going to be done for them. So that, that the next generation is going to have a cure available to them and that they won't have to deal with the, with, with the consequences of, of the disease. Um, and then faith is a, a big one for a lot of people. This person says, I go, Lord, it's in your hands and it's down the road. Um, so really leaning, leaning on faith, leaning on faith communities is helpful for people. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, teens and, and Huntington's disease because uh, teens will um, sometimes be affected but often be affected by, by a parent who's affected. Um, and adolescence is stressful enough without having to deal with Huntington's. Um, and then you throw in that teens may be caregivers on top of um, being just adolescents with with the task of, of growing up into an adult. Um, and so they'll have increased stressors beyond the typical adolescent. Um, and as well as they may need to be caregivers, the adult family members may not be able to support them in the way that, that a teenager um, would, would ordinarily need. And so that's another problem for them. And they, they, can, they also identify like sort of clusters of experiences. Um, you know, one is is they they described as watching and waiting. Uh, this is from another study where where they interviewed uh, teenagers who were part of HD families. Um, this person says, "You never know what the next thing is going to be, and it's not something anybody can tell you, and it's not something 
uh, you know if you're going to be able to slow down or if you're going to be able to fix. So feeling um, often on edge, not knowing what the next thing is going to be, sort of wondering what what's coming at them at them next. Um, people often, and this isn't just just teenagers, but but a lot of people will feel alone um, in the midst of others. So this this um, kid says. Uh, she's coming from a different point of view. I always tell her, but mom, you don't have the risk of getting it. So you can say you understand where I'm coming from. You really don't. So this is somebody who's struggling with the fact that they've got a parent who's affected. They've sort of lost um, some of that relationship with the parent. Um, and they don't know if they're also going to be living with the disease later on in their life as well. Um, added to that, many teams don't, don't, don't know anything, don't know any others from an HD family. Um, and it, the, those that do and who participate in, in youth group activities like the NYA uh, really find that helpful just to have other people who understand what they're going through and have had similar experiences. The, the fellowship that they get from that is, is um, extraordinary. Um, another thing that comes up is family life is kind of hard. My mom is working two jobs. It's kind of hard for my dad to understand her stresses and it's hard for her to understand my dad's stresses. And it's just, it just kind of creates an irritable mess. So just things generally not being easy. Um, another one is, I guess my uncle and his wife don't fully understand what my mom is going through. They can't because they don't live in the household and they don't see it all the time like me and the rest of our family do. We haven't spoken to them in like two years because my auntie got in a fight with my mom. And because of that, we've lost that part of the family because they don't understand. Um, you know, if, if, you can, if you can maintain good relationship with ex relationships with extended family, that can, that can help mitigate that. The more people that teenagers can go to uh, who they know are gonna be supportive of them, the better. That's, that's in general, not just for, for people in HD families. Um, and then probably the biggest issue is um, teens who, who feel like they have to be an adult. Um, this, this one says, my dad, he doesn't eat. You have to feed him. If he's not cooperating, then she has to take care of everything. So I try to watch over her too. I'll run her errand. I'll clean the house, cook some food. So she takes care of my dad. There's always something that needs to be done. And so, you know, teens will, will be forced to grow up too quickly. They'll take on the role of another parent, um, sometimes to try to support, uh, the, the parent who is the caregiver or to take on caregiving roles themselves. And, and you know, in families, it's, it's important to try to make space for, for teens to do the normal um, tasks of adolescence, to let them be themselves and, and grow like they need to. Um, and so, you know, you can modify some of these stressors. You know, there are a lot of different ways to cope and a lot of it will um, de depend on the, your view of the situation. So if you see the situation as, um, you know, burdensome and difficult, then you may be more likely to have neg negative coping strategies if you see it um, in some other ways as providing service or fulfilling your, your role in, in some way. Um, you may have more positive strategies. Some positive strategies are, are keeping your focus on the problem at hand, um, trying to deal with things as they come up, um, accepting that life is the way that it is. It doesn't mean liking it necessarily, but it means that um, accepting it and being able to see it for what it is. Um, and also seeking social and emotional support is, is very important. People who reach out tend to do better than people who try to try to do everything themselves. Um, the negative strategies are all some, some variety of trying to avoid um, HD. So wishful thinking, um, you know, thinking, oh, it's not as bad as, as it seems, um, you know, denying that things are, are happening that, that are happening or, or outright avoiding, uh, avoiding things. And so try to avoid, uh, avoid avoiding, um, try to focus more on positive strategies uh, for, for coping with HD than, than negative, than these negative ones. Um, and so, you know, how do we reduce caregiver burden, reduce caregiver stress? Um, one thing is education. So the more you know about HD, the easier it is to be a caregiver. doesn't mean it's going to make it easy, but if you um, know what causes it, know how, how it's, how it's going to progress, um, know what the treatments are, um, maybe even know a little bit about the research that's going on in terms of curative treatments. Um, you know, it, it helps you be able to plan ahead when you can. Um, later on, I'm going to say live in the moment also. So these two things are a little bit at odds, but um, 
you know, having that information can alleviate a lot of anxiety, sort of knowing the general road you're on, even if you're concentrating on where you are on the road, if you know where the road is going, it's easier than if you have no idea where you're headed. Um, you know, seeking support from professionals. So I, I have to plug the uh, HDSA telehealth. This is available to everybody in HD families. Every family member um, can have eight sessions with a trained um, uh, therapist or, or psychologist to talk through issues that they're having in terms of uh, living with, with HD or living with those who are affected by HD. Um, you, this is this is a really it's it's a really great resource because there aren't very many um, mental health professionals who are familiar with what HD is and what it looks like to be in a family with HD, um, and so having that resource is is really valuable. I would encourage everybody to take advantage of it. Um, it, it doesn't it, you you don't have to have a, a clinical depression or anything like that in order to to reach out for something like this just even just being able to talk through something that might be stressful in the moment is really helpful for people um, local hdsa chapters also may have information on local providers who are more familiar with hd um, if you're looking for for something in person um, let's see joining support groups very helpful i encourage everybody to join support groups when when they're able to just being around people where you don't have to explain is really powerful for a lot of people. So people who know what, what HD is, how it, um, how it affects people and, and have that lived experience, just there's camaraderie in just sort of all being in it together. Um, let's see, and okay, taking care of your own health is really important. Do the regular checkups, make sure you get the screening done that you're supposed to be getting at, at all, you know, whatever your, your family doc is, is recommending, make sure you're doing that. And um, taking advantage of respite care when, when you have to um, and when, when it's available is also um, something that, that people are often a little bit reluctant to do, but can really be helpful in terms of giving uh, caregivers a break and sort of re even resetting the relationship between caregiver and affected person in order to, to strengthen that. Um, one thing that, that I advise people to do, and this, this may sound a little bit corny, but um, this, there's actually good, good scientific research behind it, is uh, keep a gratitude journal. So something you may keep by, by the bed, just a little notebook. Um, every day, write down something you're grateful for. And this is something you're actually grateful for, not something you think you should be grateful for. That's the sort of the key to it. So it may be that, you know, I'm going to bed and I had a hard day, but, you know, I had... I don't know, I had a chocolate bar in the middle of the day and the, I was really grateful for just having had that little break. Uh, you know, I might write that down. Um, you know, other days may, may go better and you may have a, you know, a nice, a, a nice family dinner and you're grateful for that. But, you know, all those things will vary day to day. Um, and then also write down something you're proud of or that you did well during the day. Now, these things, it, it helps bring into your consciousness the good things about about life and the things that you know the reason you're basically the reason you're living it the good the good interactions with people <laughs> the good um all, all of the good things that happen because our brains are kind of wired to emphasize the bad stuff you know because we need to solve problems if we didn't notice the bad things that needed to be solved we wouldn't solve them and then you know something really bad could happen so our brains focus on that um but we want to reset them a little bit you know not to ignore the, the bad stuff and not to take focus off of problems that we need to solve, but to um, bring into consciousness the fact that life isn't only problems, that, the, that there are good things as well that we can enjoy and take, take joy from. Um, another thing that can be really helpful people is to remind yourself why you're doing it. So why are you providing care to this person? Um, you know, um, most people are doing it because providing care to a family member who's in need is, is in line with their value system in some way. Um, and keeping, bringing that into mind that this is something that, that, um, you know, you choose to do for these reasons, as opposed to something that's thrust upon you. Um, if you can reframe things in that way, it can be very helpful, um, as well. Um, setting some boundaries, like, you know, like the, the person that, that from, from one of the quotes who, um, took you know, a few minutes to herself every day after dinner, um, you know, set aside one little bit of time where that's something that you're going to you, do time. You're going to do something for yourself. Um, and also recognize you don't have to do it all. So, you know, you can, you can ask, ask for help as well. Um, 
let's see, and then stay focused on the present. So again, if, if learning about HD is sort of learning where the road is going, still staying where you are on the road and not worrying too much about the exit that's five miles ahead. Um, because then you get caught in worry thoughts and they just roam around in your head and they don't do you any good. Um, another, another thing to do is, is um, resetting expectations. So recognize what's reasonable in a situation. Um, you know, it, you may have a desired outcome, but that it's not very likely to happen, but you may have a number of outcomes that are satisfactory um, that are possible. And so recognizing what, what accommodations you may need to make, what sacrifices you need, may need to make to have a good situation or a good resolution to an, an issue rather than, um, than mourning the fact that you can't have the thing resolved in a way that you most would like it to be. Um, Dr. Again, Dr. Dr. Fader, can I interrupt you yes. real quick about a question yeah. that came through the chat? Oh, sure. uh, it, it sounds like it's around resilience, um, if I had to summarize it. The question is, is, if you're aware of any studies on teens as caregivers and is like becoming a part of that caregiving role detrimental for them? Yeah, so that's a really good question. There are not very many studies on teens as caregivers. So the one that I was quoting from um, is one of the few studies that focuses um, of what the experience of teens is in being part of an HD family, but it doesn't, it doesn't really focus on caregiving. Most studies in that are about the teen experience are either done um, in adults who are looking back at what they felt life was when, when they were growing up, or it's focused on issues of things like deciding whether or not to test. Um, and the, so for, focused on the you know, some of the, the ethical issues around testing people who are younger than 18, but there's really not, not much out there um, on uh, the burden that caregiving may put on teenagers. What we can say is that when, when teenagers in general are forced to take on um, more caregiving roles, they can become what we call parentified. So they, they lose a little bit of their adolescence and it can lead to some negative consequences down the road, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to. So it'll, it'll often lead to um, personality characteristics that may be in some ways actually very adaptive and very useful to that person later on in their life. They'll tend to be more independent um, and, and things like that, but they may also have um, trouble with other things in their life where um, they may be independent to the point of not really knowing how to reach out for help when they need it, those sorts of things. And so there, there's a trade-off. Um, as much as possible, the, the recommendation would be to, to let teenagers have as much of a teenage experience, even if there are caregiving duties that, that, that they will need to do um, or that they want to do, um, still allowing there to be room for as, as normal a, a childhood and adolescence as possible. I hope that answered that question. Let's see, looking at making sure we're good on time. All right. Um, and then let's see other things that, that can be really helpful to people. If you're a person of faith, uh, lean into that. That's something that people get, you know, an enormous amount of strength from, um, practicing mindfulness, which I'm going to talk about in just a sec. And then, um, HDSA has a lot of resources on their website. So check that out as well. Um, and so, all right. Yeah, this is the, this is the part of the, the talk where I'm going to actually require you to do something, although you don't. You don't have to, you don't actually have to, but um, these are some exercises that can be very helpful in reducing stress, um, can be helpful in calming people down in stressful situations um, and helping to reset that, that cortisol response, okay? Um, the first are a bunch of deep breathing exercises, which are fairly self-explanatory. And then I'm gonna take you through a progressive muscle relaxation exercise, which is something you can do by yourself. You don't need to be guided through it, but if somebody does it with you once, then it's easy to do it again. Um, and so the first, the first deep breathing exercise um, that I recommend to people is basically a deep inhalation and, a, and then an exhalation. And you're gonna inhale to the count of six, then exhale and repeat that. Um, you know, you'll modify that for whatever time feels right. Some people may do five, some may do seven. Some people who um, have certain lung issues like asthma or COPD may inhale more quickly and exhale more slowly. None of that is a problem. It's the, the aim you wanna expand your chest and your abdomen with the breath and then exhale fully afterwards. And so you're basically taking 
a deep breath in slowly and out slowly. Um, another one that people find helpful is called box breathing. So this is, you're gonna inhale for four seconds, hold that for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, and then hold that for four seconds and then repeat. And if you do either of these about 10 times, you can actually sort of feel a noticeable difference in terms of the amount of tension in your body and, and um, stress or anxiety that you may be uh, appreciate that you may be feeling. Um, another good one is you can take these deep breaths, not worry about how long they are or anything like that, still trying to fill your chest and abdomen and, and visualizing inhaling something good. Some people will call it like good energy or, or, you know, whatever it is. Some people will inhale light. Some people will inhale, you know, feelings of love or whatever it is, but with your breath, feel like something good is coming into your body. And that when you breathe out, you're, you're exhaling um, any bad feelings, you're exhaling the stress, that sort of thing. Um, conversely, you can do the opposite thing. This is kind of, it's a little bit of a more advanced technique. Um, and you're going to visualize inhaling the suffering of the people around you. Now, this sounds weird. Like, why would I want to inhale suffering? But what, what happens is what you're visualizing is you're inhaling the suffering and you're transforming it into healing and exhaling it. Um, again, if you, you know, if it's something you can wrap your mind around and feels meaningful to you, then I would try it. If not, you know, no, 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 no big deal. Um, but that's something that, that, um, people also find really helpful. It's worth giving a shot if you're curious. Um, and now I'm just going to take you through the progressive muscle relaxation. Um, and so what you're going to do, and if you want to, if you want to play along, I would appreciate it, but, um, you know, I won't look at you, so it's okay. Um, I'm just gonna sit in my chair so I can feel it myself. All right, what you're gonna do is you're gonna sit and put your feet on the floor so you can feel your feet on the floor. Um, you might wanna close your eyes or relax your, relax your eyes. Um, and, you know, breathe slowly and deeply. And you're gonna start with your feet, feeling them on the floor. floor. You may move your toes around a little bit. You're gonna feel you know, how your feet feel on the floor, feel your toes wiggling around, maybe you can feel your socks. And you're gonna relax the muscles in your feet. Maybe you'll uh, imagine, you know, a, a warm light coming into your feet, starting at the toes and moving its way through the foot and you feel your feet relax. And, you know, you're still through this breathing deeply and your feet are relaxing and the light makes its way up to your ankles. And you might move your ankles around a little bit, sort of stretch those joints out um, and feel the relaxation fill up to your ankles. And then it's gonna start coming up your calves and you feel your lower legs and your calves relaxing. And you know, all the time this, this warm light is, uh, is uh, filling up your filling up your legs. It's it's uh, coming up towards your knees um, as you feel your calves relax and and your knees um, are relaxing. And then after you get to the knees, you may you know you're gonna have this this warm relaxing feeling come up into your thighs. You'll feel where your thighs are pressing against the chair. You know you may actually bend your knees a little bit or or straighten them a little bit and just feel everything very relaxed as the warm light comes up through your thighs and into your hips. You know, you may um, feel a little bit in, in your lower back relaxing. Um, if you wanna move your back around a little bit to get in a more comfortable position, you can do that. And all the time you're breathing in deeply and breathing out fully. And the light, the warm, uh, relaxing feeling is making its way up your torso, through your back. And you can feel it just about under your shoulder blades right now. You might move your shoulders around a little bit, see if you can relax those. And the light makes it way, its way up, sort of making its way to your neck, but it's going to spill over your shoulders and into your arms. And you can relax your arms. You might move them around, you know, rotate your wrists, uh, wiggle your fingers a little bit as you feel the light is filling up your fingers through your wrists and then up through your arms as it sort of spills over the shoulder and fills up all of your arms. 
and then you feel it going, rising up your neck. You know, you may move your head around a little bit to relax the muscles in your neck. Um, and you feel, feel it up towards your face and your jaw and you can move your jaw around to relax your, to relax the joint there. You know, feel your tongue in your mouth, uh, feel the breath over your, you know, coming into your mouth or into your nose. And then the relaxation is, is reaching your nose and your eyes and you feel your eyes relaxing and then up your eyebrows relaxing. You may close or open your eyes, move them around a little bit and then up to the top of your head. And then you can sit there for a minute and just enjoy the fact that your entire body is feeling relaxed and take some deep breaths. Okay. You might breathe in and out. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes and look around and go back to face the world and, and whatever, whatever is going on in it. Um, and that's something that, that, you know, you can do for yourself. Um, and you know, as you get used to it, you'll, you'll find sometimes it's a little bit hard to concentrate on it to begin with, but you'll find if you do it a few times that that'll get easier. Um, and it is, uh, one of those things that's, that's really helpful. Um, that, that relaxation exercise, if you make some time to do it, uh, can, can make a, a difference in you know, your experience of stress and, uh, can lower the, the stress that you've got. And that's what I've got. I, I think that there's a, a copy of the my slides that are going to be sent out. So there are some references here if you're interested in reading them. There are a couple of links up in the, the PowerPoint as well, like to the HDSA telehealth. And um, I think just to the general HDSA website, if you're interested. Um, and now I'd like to thank you all for listening. And, and if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them.